I'm Kathy Obradovich, opinion editor at the Des Moines Register, and we're here with Democrat Cindy Axney, who's running for Congress in Iowa's 3rd District. Welcome, Cindy. Thank you. Uh, if she wins the June 5th primary, she'll face Republican incumbent David Young in November. Cindy, I uh, appreciate that you're here, and uh, in the room with us is our Register reporters and editors and the publisher, so let's go around and introduce ourselves. Great. David, you want to start? Sure. I'm David Shivers. I'm the publisher here at the Register. Bill Petrowski, reporter. Carol Hunter, executive editor. Do you want to join us, Rachel? Yeah. Rachel Stassenberger, Des Moines Register, political editor. Okay, uh, great. Well, uh, I'll, I'll start with questions. Um, these folks can all jump in as they like. Um, but uh, let's start by, uh, why don't you tell us about your background and especially what you think qualifies you to be a member of Congress. Okay. Well, wonderful. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate you doing this. Uh, the Des Moines Register has been something that I've grown up with. My mom has read the paper from front to end literally every day of her life. And uh, I grew up like that. And uh, it's been a really important uh, part of our community here in making sure that Iowans are well informed. So thank you so much. I'm grateful to have you here. And I hope to earn your support and your endorsement today. A uh, little bit about me. Uh, I'm a fifth generation Iowan with roots on the south side of Des Moines and my mom is from a farm in Warren County. Uh, we have uh, family throughout the district. Uh, I grew up here, went to the University of Iowa, was a journalism uh, major there, and uh, then uh, was one of the people that moved to Chicago for a period of time. And while I was there, had the opportunity to uh, meet my husband, get married, uh, and uh, went back to get my MBA at Northwestern Kellogg and then worked at Chicago Tribune uh, for a period of, t of time as head of leadership development. Uh, and then uh, after our second son was born, my husband and I decided it was time to move back home to Iowa because we wanted to raise our children here. And uh, during that time in Chicago, we also started up a digital design firm, a lot of website work, things like that. And we were able to transition back here uh, to the Des Moines area. Uh, I had the opportunity then to do what I really wanted to do, is practice the skills that I learned in my education at Kellogg and start at the uh, Department of Administrative Services at the state of Iowa under Governor Vilsack. And uh, had the opportunity there to be in charge of development and leadership uh, training for the state. Uh, and uh, did that for about three years, bringing in uh, opportunities that weren't necessarily happening happening at the state unless we paid for an expensive consultant like strategic planning and process improvement and operations performance uh, and as a result of that uh, the Department of Management uh, under Governor Culver's administration uh, wanted me to uh, direct strategy for the state so I moved over to the Department of Management and had the opportunity, uh, opportunity to direct a lot of strategic initiatives for the state, uh, things like the governor's agenda for clean energy and the environment, uh, help with the process of moving us towards a renewable energy state, help bring in the wind industry and uh, move us towards energy independence and put thousands of people to work in the process. So I oversaw a lot of complex statewide initiatives like that, uh, really worked with every state agency, of course, uh, helped craft policy, worked with the legislature, the governor's office, uh, but had a big focus in economic development, uh, education, uh, energy and the environment, uh, transportation and human rights, and then I ran a division at the Department of Natural Resources uh, protecting our environment. So a very strong background as a public servant, uh, protecting uh, the most vulnerable communities here, uh, helping to bring in good paying jobs. Uh, make sure that we protected our environment. And by the way, I think the most important thing was holding government accountable uh, to doing what's right and making sure that we raised up the lives of the people that live here. How did you hold government accountable? Yeah, so a lot, my, a lot of my job was really about managing performance of, uh, of our different departments. And uh, so, uh, for instance, in one, one year working with Iowa Workforce Development, when we had uh, high unemployment rates, and uh, we had moved towards a more uh, technology-based manufacturing. And so I worked with them for a year to restructure 
uh, the, the way that they delivered services, in particular within communities where we were seeing higher unemployment and not enough skilled workers for those manufacturing uh, companies. And so worked with them to re redesign how they delivered that, those services to make sure that we could pair up those individuals with those manufacturing companies and get people employed and get our companies the people that they needed. And then my job, I, I would work with them on a consistent basis, following back up with them, making sure that uh, we were actually putting uh, these pieces in place, that people were getting these jobs, that the manufacturing companies uh, were becoming, uh, that they had more skilled labor as a result of these processes. So uh, that's just one example, but my job really was about making sure that we put these important strategies in place to reach those performance outcomes, and then consistently working with those uh, those departments to go back and make sure that we were moving in that direction, as I always like to say, uh, moving the needle and uh, in a positive way. And if we weren't closing uh, that gap uh, where the, for the outcome that we were trying to achieve, then restructure how we were delivering those services so that we could. This is your first time seeking public office, correct? That's correct. So, but you've had some political experience and campaign experience uh, is that right tell us about that uh, well not necessarily a heck of a lot of campaign experience uh, I, I did help out with a friend of mine rich Leopold who had run for was early on in running for the governor and and spent uh, several months uh, helping him and uh, it's when I really decided I needed to get more involved in the process and uh, so that would have been my specific a campaign experience. Of course, I've worked on a lot of campaigns, canvassing and calling, uh, in, in particular for many of our presidential campaigns. Uh, but I've done a lot of community activism as well, and I think that that's really important. Uh, one of the things I was able to do was help secure all-day kindergarten in West Des Moines. Uh, I, I mentioned we moved back here for our children, and uh, we, I had enrolled my older son, who's now 16, goes to Valley, uh, and about 30 days before he started school, we got a letter, and it said, your son lost the lottery. He gets the two-and-a-half-hour version of kindergarten as opposed to the full day. And that's when I found out that half the kids in one of our largest school districts literally lost a lottery and didn't get that opportunity. They got a much uh, much less uh, opportunity than other kids. So I got busy. I couldn't help my own son, but I could sure help the kids coming after him. And worked for about eight months getting that uh, pushed up through the administration and I realized we had one meeting left uh, where this needed to be passed uh, by the board and I've got pretty sharp elbows when it comes to doing what's right so I ended up putting together the data on the subject matter and equity and presented it to them and said you know you've got to get this changed for the kids next year or I'm taking it to the Des Moines Register and the head of the Department of Education and letting them know you're not living up to this district's expectations and you're failing its kids and its families well, they passed it. Uh, that superintendent's one of my big supporters uh, because he knows when it comes to doing what's right, I'm going to be in there for the long haul. I'm not going to stop until we get the job done. So I've done a lot of community activism work, whether it's doing that or helping to stop development through Walnut Woods Park for an unnecessary new road. And uh, I think that those are also opportunities for people to have a good learning experience to be able to uh, hold a political office. What is it that made you decide, okay, I'm going to run for Congress? Uh, what, what, was there an issue or what, what was the situation that pushed you over to decide that you're going to run? Well, I, th I think it had been com uh, compounding. I actually uh, took the position at the state of Iowa uh, over a decade ago because I wanted to do something where I knew I could help others and that I could benefit uh, my state and possibly get involved uh, with something political, but in a way that I knew I could walk in right away and hit the ground running and help out. Uh, so I've always had an interest in making sure that our government runs well and that it's most effective for the people that it serves. Uh, certainly with this last election, uh, our, our presidential election, I'd been uh, heavily involved in uh, trying to get out the vote, uh, making sure that I was canvassing and calling and, uh, and, and, and hoping for the best and of course was sorely disappointed. Uh, and uh, went, actually went out for about a 10-mile walk the next day uh, and came back home and said, I've got to do something different because something, if, if this is where our country has decided we need to go, then apparently uh, we need people to step up and, and make sure that we're moving in the right direction. So that was really a combined uh, opportunity for me, taking what I like to do, which is solve complex government problems and help people. and. Uh, knowing that the traje trajectory of our country wasn't moving in the direction that I think was the most positive and thinking and knowing that it's time to step up. 
What do you think sets you apart from your uh, Democratic opponents in this primary? Uh, well, I, th I think first and foremost, it's it's experience, and this is a two-year job. Uh, whether we like it or not, you got to be able to hit the ground running. And unfortunately, uh, it's also a job where you have to continue to fundraise, which is why we need to uh, uh, get rid of Citizens United. Um, but uh, I think that you have to be able to walk into the situation and be ready to go on day one. And having spent a decade helping to solve. Uh, complex issues, working with the federal government, working with the state government, uh, certainly the administration, uh, and helping to craft policy, helping to think through issues that that really are in multiple areas, from education uh, to energy, uh, I think really is an advantage that, that I have in, in walking in and being able to hit the ground running. Uh, I also think persistence. And uh, I'm, oh, I'm somebody who, who never gives up. And uh, I think we need that out in Congress. We need somebody who's a fighter, who's going to stand up for what's right uh, and not back down and uh, until the job's done. That doesn't mean that I won't work with anybody. I'll work with anybody. I don't care if it's Republicans or Democrats, as long as it's right for the people here in our corner of the state. Uh, but I think we need somebody who is constantly going to be uh, a, a beacon of uh, hope for the values that we believe in in our Democratic Party and consistently push for those no matter what it takes. Do you have a, a story about when you worked with Republicans, maybe when you were in the Bill Sack or Culver administrations? Yeah, well, so uh, I actually worked uh, for a couple years into the Brandstead administration. Uh, I left the state about now four and a half years ago. Uh, so, so I have worked under a Republican administration. Uh, so I've, I, I've already had to practice that. Uh, and there were, there were many things that I had to push back on uh, uh, under this current uh, administration that I didn't think were appropriate. Uh, I oversaw about 10 different units at any given time at the Department of Natural Resources, and one of those was human resources. Uh, and uh, this, there was a time where uh, this current uh, Branstead's administration uh, wanted to make all merit-covered employees uh, at at will, uh, essentially serving like I was serving at the pleasure of the governor. Uh, and uh, I didn't agree with that. We, we already had gone through making sure that uh, our, uh, our union-covered employees uh, remained union-covered, and so they weren't able to address that in Branstead's first term back, and so they started going after the merit-covered employees, which of course isn't something that would benefit Iowans. Uh, it would take positions like supervisors and um, scientists, uh, uh, those who have uh, the, the education and the experience to solve the problems that we have in government and really make them uh, expendable dependent on uh, who's, who's in charge. And that's not the right way to run government. We need to run government with people who understand how to solve these issues, who have the background and the experience to do it. So I push back against that. Uh, it wasn't met with the uh, greatest response in this administration, but we kept pushing and uh, they eventually they uh, dropped uh, pursuing that. I, my question, though, was about a time when you worked with Republicans oh. <laughs> to get something done, and you, you told me a story about how you worked worked against them. So, uh, do you have do you have a story about working with Republicans? Well, I think that uh, I've I in. Really, on a daily basis, I had to work with Republicans. I re reported into a Republican director, uh, and uh, of course, who reported into a Republican governor. And so, uh, on a daily basis, that was my responsibility: was to work with uh, the director of the DNR and the deputy director uh, to make sure that we uh, protected our environment. Uh, so, I uh, had a good relationship with the directors that I worked with at the DNR, and uh, really tried to put the mission before any political uh, beliefs whatsoever and make sure that we were constantly working towards what's right for the environment here in Iowa, uh, no matter what side of the fence you're on. But, oh, go ahead, Carol. I wanted to hop in and ask about the DNR regulation. Um, uh, one of the ongoing controversies in Iowa is regulations of confined animal feeding operations. and. Uh, many Democrats say that they should be regulated more, that counties should be given more authority to be able to, um, in essence, have zoning uh, rules that would apply. Yet during Chet Culver's administration with Democratic majorities, that kind of legislation never went through, should it? I, I believe it should. Uh, Why didn't it then? 
Uh, I, I don't know all of the uh, the reasons why it didn't go through then, but I believe in looking forward in the future, we absolutely need to address the issue of CAFOs in this state. Uh, our uh, Clean Water Act doesn't uh, currently address our CAFOs as well as it should. Uh, it hasn't been updated to accurately reflect the agricultural industry as it currently stands. And uh, really we need to make sure that there's a level playing field and that every industry uh, that's regulated uh, should have to follow the same regulations to make sure that we keep our environment clean and safe. Uh, so I'd like to see us make sure that that's an opportunity for people here in Iowa. And I, I do believe that communities should be involved in uh, the decision as to where CAFOs are positioned uh, because it can uh, adversely impact their life, uh, their community, uh, and their economy. Uh, and so I think it's important that we include uh, all those who, are effect, uh, those who are affected by it into the uh, decision making process. It's been a fairly bipartisan philosophy over the years that uh, regardless of what happens with environmental policy, um, the state of Iowa doesn't want the feds to come in and do it, right? It's been sort of a bipartisan agreement that we have to do what we can to follow the regulations up to the point um, that we don't have the federal government coming in to regulate it. So what do you see as the federal role with regard to these environmental issues? And when do you stop at the state's border and say, okay, you guys have to do it? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, that's a great question, and it's, of course, very complicated. We have so many good farmers here in Iowa, in particular our small and mid-sized farmers, Iowa farmers, who are trying to be good stewards of our environment. Uh, but we often see uh, large corporate farms or farms that are owned by uh, out-of-state entities who aren't uh, necessarily as involved in ensuring that uh, we are, are you know, are good stewards of our environment, make sure that we retain our soil quality, protect our water, et cetera. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, I applaud Iowans for trying to make sure that uh, we can figure this problem out on our own. Um, I think that there are people who have actively, as I mentioned, actively tried to be good players to improve in this area. Uh, however, uh, we are falling short. Uh, and uh, we absolutely need to find a better solution because voluntary compliance isn't working for us. Uh, so I do believe that uh, where we're at in the state and in this country is that environmental issues are, are not just impacting our state, they're impacting our country and they're impacting the world. And we just need to be thoughtful about the regulations that we put in place to make sure that uh, we're continuing to help our farmers uh, have good yields but increase uh, the, the make sure that their soil uh, stays healthy uh, but we also need to step in and if that requires uh, the federal government at some point because we can't seem to address it here in the state then that's something that we're going to have to possibly look at uh, because it is important that uh, we maintain our environmental um, uh, regulations so that we have a safe and, and healthy environment for people. Do you think the waters of the U.S. regulations should stand? Uh, yes. So, you, I'm sorry, you said you want to keep that rule, the yeah. waters of the U.S.? Okay. We hear, we hear the Republicans, as somebody who goes to Republican events all the time, that's the worst thing that ever ha happened in, in fed, federal government. It's a complete takeover of if is you you've heard the, the the explanations if if somebody has a trickle of water on, on, on their farm the governor wants to declare it a, a lake or, or a river what about that well I mean I, I think in I don't know specifically every single case that they've brought up but I do think it's important to look at individual cases as they arise uh, so I think we uh, listen every regulation that we put in place whether it's at a state or a federal level uh, has a specific outcome that it's trying to obtain and I think it's important that we go back and make sure that that regulation is moving us in the direction to reach that outcome because it should be a positive one if it's not a positive one then we absolutely need to look at uh, the regulation to make sure that it's working for people uh, however if it is uh, then uh, we're going to have to find a way to work with people who disagree with it and make sure that it does continue uh, to support a clean and healthy environment. What would be your plan for improving health care? Well, I'll tell you what, we've got a lot of work to do there. Um, when my husband and I started our small business about 16 years ago, we couldn't get maternity coverage as part of an individual plan back then unless we paid for a rider that cost $1,000 a month and then held that in place for at least a year before becoming pregnant. Well, we couldn't afford that. 
So when we had our second son, who's now almost 14, uh, we had to sell our personal items on eBay just to cover the cost of those medical bills because I had a baby in the hospital. So I certainly understand the struggles that Iowa families face, that Americans families face uh, when it comes to affordable, effective health care. And we should never go back to a place where the Republicans want to take us, uh, which is taking away coverage for pre-existing conditions, um, certainly uh, putting lifetime caps back on, uh, and of course, uh, out outpricing uh, the needs of our seniors where they couldn't afford the services and the medicine they need and that's not right no family should ever be faced with a decision on whether they put food on the table or make sure that their family's healthy so I want to do two things uh, I want to uh, shore up the Affordable Care Act uh, make sure that we uh, reduce the costs within that including the cost of prescription drugs uh, that we continue to include uh, people with pre-existing conditions uh, that there is no lifetime caps put on and that we uh, continue to make uh, uh, prescriptions and services affordable for everybody. Um, but at the same time, I want to introduce a public option so that people can buy into uh, Medicare or, or Medicaid uh, because every single person deserves affordable, effective care. And I think that this is our first, this is our best opportunity and, and uh, our quickest opportunity <laughs> to get to universal coverage for everybody uh, that's affordable and effective. Why uh, allowing a public option as opposed to Medicare for all, as some Democrats have been talking about? Well, I, I, I'll tell you what, we pay almost, what, we pay about 19% of our GDP goes to uh, health costs here in this country. Uh, and uh, so th this issue isn't just about who's, who's paying for it. And as a single payer, uh, you know, which would be Medicare for all, that, that's a single payer universal plan. Uh, it really is about also controlling the costs within it. And I think that providing a public option uh, in a competitive environment will help us lower costs. Uh, it will also get us to the end result, which is really what is most important, is that everybody has affordable, effective health care uh, and that they have the health care that they need when they need it. Uh, and I think it's the, uh, the least expensive way and also the fastest way that we can get to that outcome. And so I'm proposing that because this is an issue that has to be addressed immediately, and I think it's the best way that we can all come together and make sure that that public option is out there. And I think by providing that public option, as I mentioned, we'll start seeing more competition and we're gonna see costs reduced within the system. Okay. What about mental health um, and substance abuse? Uh, are there what, what needs to be done there from the federal level? Yeah, well, so so uh, boy, I'll tell you what. With over twenty five percent of our population affected uh, with some type of mental health issue, everybody's affected. Whether it's your friends or your family, uh, so this is an epidemic uh, that we need to address. Uh, one of the first things that we need to do is uh, move away from the stigma around mental health. Uh, that's uh, a big issue uh, that I think, unfortunately. Uh, causes people to look at it as something that so many people can just get over uh, when in reality it's a health issue just like any other health issue that we have. So first and foremost I want to raise awareness and make sure that uh, this country understands that this is an epidemic that's affecting families, it's affecting our communities, it's affecting our economy, it's affecting our businesses and uh, we have to address it. That's the first thing I want to do. Uh, secondly, uh, I want to make sure that, the, that we provide funding for the CDC and the NIH and make sure that we also continue expanded Medicaid subsidies that are now covering uh, mental health services uh, because they've been incredibly helpful. We need to protect and grow those so that we can overcome this issue. Uh, but I'll tell you what, one of the things that uh, I, I'm supported uh, by people who are heavily involved in the mental health industry here, and I've been really trying to learn ab about it as much as possible, and uh, I want to take us to a point where we actually start addressing the root causes behind mental health. Uh, one of the biggest issues with our kids is suffering from a traumatic experience when, when they're younger. And those are things that we should be able to address as a community. Those are things like food scarcity, moving from uh, home to home or shelter to shelter because the parent doesn't have an opportunity for a good paying job that allows that uh, opportunity for their child. Uh, being bullied in school, uh, that also comes from moving from school to school as well. Uh, and, and so many other issues, abuse in the homes. And so we've got to address these issues at a community level. And we have the, we, we can do that. Uh, if we 
put our resources in the right place where our values are, we can start knocking out those issues that are causing so much of, of the stress and mental health that people are facing in this country. So I want to take us beyond just what we can do from a regulatory perspective and from a resource perspective uh, to help because we need to, of course, increase the programs and services that we have to address this issue, but we also need to start looking at the root causes behind it. You uh, have a, a background in management and uh, budgeting, um, but you look at the federal government with out of control debt and deficits, um, a lot of priorities uh, on your agenda that cost money. So uh, how do you bring a fiscally responsible perspective to Congress? Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, I think the Democratic Party is the party of fiscal responsibility. Uh, we've seen the, our economy grow under uh, Democrat administrations, and I believe that we put our uh, money where the, val where, where the right places and the, value, the areas that will create value in people's lives. Uh, I was lucky enough to uh, serve in two administrations here in the state. Uh, where we were able to deliver better services, uh, but at the same time, uh, we also saved uh, $200 million in savings. We didn't lay people off, we didn't cut services, and we left almost a billion dollars in the coffer uh, for a rainy day here in Iowa, which has now uh, been gone through. And so I've been uh, in an opportunity to work for very effective governments, accountable governments, and know that we can do that. One of the first things that we need to do so that our debt doesn't continue to spiral out of control uh, when I get to Congress is go address this tax bill. Uh, the tax bill that's going to put about $1.5 trillion of debt uh, on our backs, on our kids' backs, uh, and certainly on the middle class. And uh, so we've got to address that first and foremost. Uh, unfortunately, uh, with the rate that things are going, uh, there's always something new that's important to address. But right now, that's the tax bill. Because if we don't continue, uh, if we don't address that, uh, we aren't going to have the revenues to cover uh, the things that we need to be putting in place to help the people in our country. So that's the first and foremost thing I'm going to get after when I get to Congress. If you're a small business owner, do, doesn't this tax bill benefit your business and allow you opportunities to expand and grow and create jobs? You're right. It absolutely does uh, benefit my business. Uh, and so uh, I'm grateful for that as a business owner. 92% uh, of the businesses in this country are small businesses and they need uh, support. That's something that hasn't happened uh, much. The tax rate's been higher, the access to capital has been limited, and there's been more opportunity for large corporations. So it's good to see that small businesses are getting something. However, um, I've always approached uh, the way I look at things as uh, how does this fit with the benefit for everybody? Uh, just by, it's not right to think, well, this works for me, so I don't need to be concerned about how, uh, how this doesn't help others. And so that's my philosophy of thinking is that that's great. That's going to give us some opportunity to expand our business, uh, to hire more people, deliver better services. Uh, but, we, but in general, the tax bill is not doing that uh, across this country. It's short-term breaks for middle-class families, long-term breaks for the rich and corporations, uh, and, uh, and also it's offset uh, with other write-offs that the middle class can't take. And it's putting that debt burden on us for uh, our, our here to I don't know when. And so that's why it's important that we address this. It's not about just what I get. It's about what works for our country. Addressing the tax bill or the public option with the President Trump when he thinks those things are anathema and the tax bill was his signature achievement, if you win, he will still be president. How do you think you'll make progress on those? On the tax bill, uh, listen, I'm hoping that we flip enough seats uh, that we get some balance in Congress. Uh, I would love to see us uh, flip a lot of seats and make sure that we've got the opportunity there to work across the aisle with others. Uh, I believe that there are good people on both sides of the fence, Republicans and Democrats, who want to see what's best for this country and what's best for their constituents. And I know there are people, Republicans and Democrats, who know that this tax bill doesn't necessarily benefit the majority of the people that they represent. Uh, it represents a very small uh, minority, the top 1%. And uh, I think there's a lot of people who are w willing, uh, if we can get 
uh, enough consensus to come together and work on a tax bill that they know works for their constituents. Uh, just like you all, uh, as a journalism undergrad, I'm notorious for asking six questions uh, to get to a root cause. Uh, and uh, uh, I think it's one of the things that gives me an advantage when I'm talking with other people is finding that nugget, so to speak, where I can have a relationship with somebody who I might not necessarily be on the same page with uh, to start having a conversation with them about what benefits uh, their family, their community, their friends, uh, and I think that's the tax bill is a place where we can find that. What, what aspect of the tax bill do you think has the most potential for a bipartisan interest in fixing it? Uh, I, I think that we could look at uh, higher uh, tax breaks for the middle class, uh, uh, higher uh, child care tax credits, um, certainly uh, making sure child uh, child cre credits as well. Boy, having two uh, kids myself, I know that what we uh, can write off is pretty minimal compared to uh, the cost that it takes to raise children and certainly the cost of um, daycare. Uh, and so those are two areas that I think we should definitely look at. Uh, and, um, and to your point, I want to make sure that we continue to help small businesses and, and also uh, a lot of people who are moving into uh, digital work, uh, in particular young people, entrepreneurs who are wanting to start up their own businesses, who are uh, wanting to work many different types of jobs uh, that's a little bit more exciting for them uh, to make and uh, you know not necessarily going to work for a corporation for the next 20 years but building something on their own and I want to make sure that we continue to help out people who want to help us with that entrepreneurial opportunity in our country. Well, wouldn't that cost more? You said that one of the things you would do to address the spiraling deficit is addressing the tax bill. More tax credit, more breaks for the middle class, more breaks for entrepreneurs would actually cost more. It wouldn't Rain in. Well, there are. Listen, there's always a give and take, uh, and certainly there. If we are going to provide uh, tax incentives, tax breaks, then we're going to have to shore up the revenue some other way. You're absolutely correct, and so uh, I I believe that these long-term tax cuts uh, for the corporations uh, should not be the way they are. Uh, we already had seen uh, opportunity for corporations to take major deductions uh, in the previous uh, tax rate uh, to essentially lower the amount of taxes that they paid to about half. Uh, so uh, I think we've got opportunity there uh, to make sure that we have a reasonable tax rate for our corporations, but that they actually provide the revenue that we need to operate. They're benefiting uh, from our infrastructure, uh, from our economy, and it's important that everybody pays a fair share. I wanted to go back and uh, just a fact check on something you said uh, when addressing fiscal responsibility. I believe you said that there were no layoffs under Democratic administrations that you were part of. In Chet Culver's administration, there were layoffs and furloughs after the Great Recession. Yeah, well, so what I was referring to is when we had, uh, towards the end of his uh, administration, we had to find $200 million in savings, and we did that without laying people off and without cutting services. There were, you're right, there were some furloughs. Yes. Yeah. And layoffs. Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure about that, but I appreciate, I, yeah. Check. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the great uncertainties uh, for the Iowa's economy is uh, what's gonna happen with trade policy. Um, and specifically NAFTA, um, which has, um, kind of cuts both ways sometimes in, in democratic politics. So how do you feel about NAFTA? Would you make specific changes to the treaty? Um, and uh, <laughs> if it was a choice between leaving it alone or making changes, um, uh, would you, um, would you, I guess you would, would you opt for upsetting the apple cart as opposed to uh, opening that treaty up? Yeah, well, I think we always need to look at our trade agreements to make sure that they're working for hardworking Iowans and hardworking Americans. Uh, uh, NAFTA, uh, I believe we should look at it from an ongoing perspective as opposed to it uh, retiring every five years, we need to be, I think it should be ongoing and that we're consistently looking at it. A good example of that is our new digital economy that really isn't included uh, in these trade agreements. And so uh, we've got a whole opportunity there to look at new types of businesses, new types of products, digital products that 
uh, we aren't that haven't been included. So that's why it's important that we stay up with what's happening with industry. Um, I also think it's important that we look at. Uh, how it's uh, labor standards and making sure that there is a level playing field uh, with the countries who are involved in the trade agreements uh, to make sure that those labor standards are fair across the board uh, and that we're uh, ensuring that countries are treating employees fairly, safely, and humanely uh, and that we are ensuring that there's a level playing field when it comes to the production of cost of goods. Uh, so I always think that there's opportunity to look at things to see if there is room for improvement. Uh, certainly NAFTA has been very beneficial for our farmers here in Iowa, uh, but at some points it hasn't been as beneficial for our manufacturing sector. Uh, so it's important that we take a look at any trade agreement and ensure that it's continuing to work for the people uh, in our state and in our country. On balance, do you think NAFTA has been more positive for Iowa or, or more negative? Yeah, more positive. Okay. All right. Um, would you support a national increase in the minimum wage, and if so, um, what's appropriate? Uh, yeah, I think we need to increase our minimum wage. Uh, certainly anybody that's in this country working 40 hours a week uh, obviously needs to uh, have a, a living wage that supports themselves and their family. Uh, so that's what I want to see us move to. Uh, I don't know exactly what that number necessarily is. I think we also need to be thoughtful about the communities and making sure that uh, communities have opportunity to weigh in on what, what works well for them here. I know that uh, in Des Moines, uh, the, you know, we were hopefully trying to get past a, a higher minimum wage. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we need to all take into consideration as we're doing that uh, is making sure that our business owners uh, can afford it, that uh, people who are uh, receiving subsidies for things like childcare don't fall off a cliff because their income is increased and then they don't uh, get that support and it actually ends up costing them and making life more difficult for them. So it's not, a, it's not just something we can say, well, here's a certain number that works. We need to consider all of those uh, those variables within it and make sure that we're uh, helping our communities be more successful, individuals be more successful, uh, and uh, growing the economy in all those communities. So are you saying you raise the national minimum wage and then let communities make a case for being exempted from that? Or are you saying um, that uh, you uh, may just make it easier for communities to raise their minimum wage higher? I mean, I, I don't quite understand. If you, you know, you're setting a floor with the, with the federal minimum, minimum wage, so where does that community input come in? Yeah, well, I, I think it's important that at a federal level we, we set a floor. I'm not exactly sure what that should be at this moment. Uh, I, I know we've tossed, tossed $15 an hour has been tossed around. Uh, that's definitely something that needs to be looked at, but we do need to set some type of floor. The problem with our current minimum wage is that it hasn't kept up with the cost of living, hasn't kept up with inflation, uh, and we also need to make sure that when we uh, raise the minimum wage that it's tied to inflation so that it continues to grow. Uh, so that's a big issue that, that we need to address. Uh, what I'm saying is I believe that there is some type of standard that we should work towards, but I believe communities should have some input in that as well. It's going to be different here in Iowa than it is in New York City. Uh, and uh, I think we need to be thoughtful about the different needs in those communities. What would you propose to improve college affordability? Or, or is that a concern of yours? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when, when I grew up here and my sister and I both went to, well, I went to Iowa, she went to the University of Northern Iowa, my parents could afford to send us to school on a middle class income and uh, not incur any debt. And uh, when I went back to get my MBA, uh, schools had become so expensive that I had to take out a student loan and pay for that for years to come. Uh, and now I've got uh, two boys who are uh, quickly approaching going off to school, and I wonder how my husband and I are going to end up paying for this. So we've got a big issue there. Uh, so there are several things. First of all, I want to make sure that we uh, continue uh, with and increase uh, Pell Grants, uh, absolutely continue with student loan forgiveness programs. Uh, and I want to make sure that we cap student loan interest rates at no more than 2% because really nobody should be profiting off our kids' futures. Uh, so we've got a lot of opportunity there uh, to make sure that we provide uh, low interest rates for people to you know, get their educations uh, and, uh, I, again, continue with Pell Grants as well as student loan forgiveness programs. Uh, some candidates have suggested um, free college, um, uh, maybe setting some um, limits on you know what you have to do to earn that. But 
um, uh, free college, free community college. What, what do you think of those ideas? Listen, I think we should look at every possibility of giving every person an opportunity for uh, post-secondary education. Um, whether that's an, a, a trades program, an apprenticeship program, uh, whether it's a two-year college or it's a four-year college. I think it's incredibly important. We all know that uh, when you get uh, uh, an education after high school that you're going to have a better opportunity at life. And I'm not concerned about making that a four-year college, a two-year college, or, a, or an apprenticeship uh, program. I think it just needs to be, be one of those. Uh, so I think there is opportunity to figure out a way that we can give every single uh, kid in this country an opportunity for an education uh, and if they can't afford it make sure that uh, we can find a way for that to happen I don't know what that would look like at this time but I think it's something that we should explore what do you think is the appropriate role for the federal government in k-12 education um, and would you um, would you continue to allow public funds for private and parochial schools uh, no, uh, I, I don't agree with what's happening in uh, Washington right now under Secretary DeVos uh, diverting public school money uh, towards a voucher program. Uh, our public schools are already uh, under a lot of uh, difficulty uh, to, to be successful. Class sizes are incredibly large. Uh, they're dealing with issues that they never had to deal with in the past. Uh, I went to Lovejoy Elementary School on the southeast side and uh, it was a middle income school when I went there. Uh, now it's uh, almost 100% free and reduced lunch program. And a friend of mine is actually the principal there. You know, they have washers and dryers on site uh, to make sure that uh, the clothes that are donated get washed and sent home with children who need them. Of course, uh, there's the free and reduced lunch program, as well as making sure that kids go home on the weekends and, and evenings and at other times uh, where they might not have food with a backpack full of food. They're dealing with mental health issues, uh, dealing now with security in our schools with a, a gun violence uh, and so our teachers just have too much to deal with and so do the administrations and not enough resources behind them only about eight percent of our funding for schools comes from federal government uh, and so what's happening out in Washington uh, with Secretary DeVos uh, wanting to dip into that I think is unconscionable we need to make sure that our K through 12 public school systems have everything that they need and so I'll go out there and protect and grow what resources we have and make sure that uh, every kid has an opportunity for success. Some school administrators in Iowa and around the country have uh, argued that um, every penny from the federal government um, might come with 25 cents worth of strings attached, right? I, maybe not in that proportion, but they're concerned about um, too many federal rules and restrictions that come with the, the money that comes in from the federal government. So, I mean, what role do you see the federal government having in setting standards, in, um, in uh, having the money that they send back be kind of an encouragement for behavior? Uh, how many strings are you attaching? Yeah, well, I think it's important that the federal uh, government uh, participates in setting standards for our public school system across this country. But we've seen uh, in the past uh, where there have been uh, things that don't necessarily work for our kids and for our schools. And uh, we need to make sure, again, that we're going back and saying, are the outcomes that we're looking for being achieved? And if they aren't through those specific regulations, then we, we need to look at uh, pulling back on those and making sure that they're not hurting our schools or hindering uh, kids from being successful. Uh, so I think that there is a role for federal government to work with state government uh, on those issues to make sure that we build up every single school and make sure that what that school uh, has as far as support uh, really reflects the specific needs that they have in whatever community they're in to make sure that those kids have opportunity. What does uh, religious freedom mean to you when it comes to the government and how would you apply your philosophy um, as you think about legislation? Uh, well, I, religious freedom to me as it replies to the government is that everybody has the opportunity to practice uh, the religion or of their choice or not practice. Uh, and that uh, any uh, that the government should not be involved in that decision making process nor influence it in any way uh, and I also believe that uh, we need to uh, encourage and support uh, religious freedom uh, in businesses I don't believe that businesses uh, should be able to uh, determine what their employees or their customers uh, get 
uh, because of the religious beliefs that they have as business owners. Um, I don't think that the employers should influence employee or uh, employee religious beliefs or, uh, be, or, or push back on the delivery of services or products because they don't believe in something. What about religious employers, though? Um, if, for example, uh, church-owned private colleges or, or those kinds of things, do, do they have the right to say um, that their employees have to uphold certain standards or do they have the right to say that they're not going to provide insurance for things that they don't believe in, like um, uh, I guess one one example was contraception. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll I'll go back to I think that it's not it's not in our best interest to have businesses influence their employees' religious beliefs, and so I would say that you know we we were uh, we obviously need to keep church and state separate. Uh, religious beliefs don't belong uh, in uh, business or in government. Uh, and uh, we need to uh, protect the integrity of everybody's religious beliefs, their individual beliefs, and not influence those. I guess in that case, though, what she's saying, though, is if you are a religious institution, should the government be able to come into that religious institution, for example? And, for example, if a church, St. Catharines of Siena <coughs> here, uh, this is several years ago, employed a chan transgender woman and who was living a transgender lifestyle, and she was terminated. Should the Catholic Church be required to employ somebody l like that who has, who is practicing lifestyle or, or has an orientation that is contrary to that church's religion? Uh, well, absolutely. In that particular instance, I, I believe that that was a discrimination uh, and that that person should not have been discriminated against that way. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate that we do have these conflicts in our society, but we absolutely need to keep church and state separate uh, and ensure that uh, we support the individual rights of every single person. Should the government impose any new restrictions on abortion, or would you roll back the restrictions that are in place today, any, any in particular? Uh, you, you, uh, I th I th uh, what I want to do is just make sure that we go out there and protect the, the women's reproductive freedom. Uh, I think that that's incredibly important. When a woman is able to choose when and how she starts a family, she has the opportunity to uh, control her life, her opportunities, and her chance for success in her career. And uh, so I just want to make sure that we protect women's right to choose. Uh, and that uh, that we're a strong voice for that because women need every single opportunity uh, that men have, uh, and certainly our reproductive rights are a key uh, opportunity are a key opportunity for women to be able to take the path that they want. So protect what you what you have, but would you are there restrictions that have been added in recent years that you would like to roll back? Uh, I don't believe there's any restrictions that have been passed that I necessarily would want want to roll back. Okay. Um, you mentioned gun violence a few minutes ago um, related to schools. Um, what are, what would be your priorities in dealing with gun violence um, and, um, and including school safety also? Well, one of the uh, bureaus I had the opportunity to oversee at the Department of Natural Resources was hunting and fishing licensing. So I'm really f I'm familiar with Iowa's history of gun ownership for sport and protection. And really, those hunters wanted to make sure that there was good safety, good training, good uh, good gun control uh, safety in their homes as well uh, to make sure that uh, those who were using firearms did so in a safe manner. And I know most of Americans want to see that as well. Uh, so we've got a, a big issue here. We've got 96 people a day who die from gun violence and you know we've been seeing school shootings just uh, on uh, almost every single week since the beginning of the year uh, whether it's been a, a large-scale shooting or, or one person we've had just too many of them and so we've absolutely need to do something about this if this was a health care issue we'd be addressing it uh, and so I want to make sure that we've got universal background checks uh, that we close the loopholes at our gun shows our online sales and person-to-person -person transfers uh, to make sure that we keep the guns out of the hands of of people with criminal and violent backgrounds. Uh, and I also want to see us reinstate the assault weapons ban uh, that's been off the books for over a decade. 
Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, I'm a mom of two teenage boys, and I send them off to school every day. And we're now at a point in our society where parents are hoping that their kids make it home safe that day. Uh, and that's just a thought that's too hard to bear. And I think we should not be living in a society where we have to consider that as an issue for our children, our families, and our public schools, our schools in general, uh, to deal with. So we absolutely need to get this fixed. Uh, immigration is uh, uh, continuing to be an issue, although this administration has focused more on border security. Um, would you, first of all, would you seek to expand legal immigration in this country, legal immigration? And secondly, um, what uh, do you think is the correct path um, in dealing with people who have come here illegally um, but are not breaking other laws? Yeah, well, uh, not too long ago I was able to attend the uh, LULAC uh, annual awards dinner and there were a couple of dreamers who received awards and it was really um, really a heartening experience but also disheartening at the same time so these are kids young people now who grew up here went to school here uh, their families are here they're now adults they're they've gone they've got jobs, they're contributing to our economy, paying taxes, uh, and um, doing so much for our community that they're actually getting awards for it. Uh, but it, listening to them speak and talk about how grateful that they are for that opportunity here, uh, they, uh, they say it in the same breath that, but you know, at any given point in time, we might be asked to leave this country. Uh, and I don't think that that's the kind of country that we ought to be. Uh, we've always been a welcoming country. Uh, Iowa's been a welcoming state. I think uh, Republican Governor Robert Ray was a great example of of that uh, and we need to make sure that we continue uh, welcoming immigrants and refugees who are facing really difficult circumstances uh, in the places where they live. Uh, we've seen it be a benefit to our economy. Uh, I want to make sure that we give our dreamers a pathway uh, to uh, uh, be uh, citizens, full citizens here. Uh, we need to make sure that that happens uh, quickly uh, and I also want to make sure that we've got an opportunity for a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants without a criminal background. Um, I don't believe that uh, this is an issue that's solved by putting up a wall. Um, I think it's an issue that's solved through comprehensive immigration reform to make sure that uh, we protect our national security, but to also make sure that we're doing what's smart for our country, uh, what's humane for the people that are here, and what's best for our economy. What's the right balance between um, a a functional immigration system um, and uh, main, making sure that we're not, um, it, you know, essentially uh, bringing people in to take jobs that Americans should be doing. Well, I think that uh, that would that takes a little bit of digging into. Uh, I don't I, I don't know exactly what the specific balance would look like, but I think you hit the nail on the head there. There is a balance there, and um, we absolutely need to make sure that we're supporting Americans and American workers. Um, but we also need to make sure that we're uh, understanding that our economy is changing, uh, that we need to have enough skilled workers here, and we need to be open uh, to bringing in uh, as many people uh, as, uh, as it takes to make sure that we continue to thrive economically. But we also need to uh, go back to just being open about helping those in need across this world. Uh, we have a lot of countries where uh, so many people are suffering, they're trying to flee uh, regimes uh, where their, their families are being killed, uh, there's not enough food, uh, it's a very unsafe environment. Uh, and uh, you know, we, we've got an opportunity here in this country to open our arms to people like that and make sure that they've got opportunity. But we, we just, to your point, have to balance that with what's gonna be best for our country as well. I don't know the exact, what that balance would look like, but it's there. Are there issues where you think you would probably disagree with your party leadership? And, and if so, what, what would you do in that situation? Yeah, um, well, I think uh, you asked about NAFTA earlier. I think that's probably one, one area. Um, and so uh, I, I, I'd, I'd move forward with the uh, discussion within the party that uh, we 
in many cases with NAFTA, are hurting some of our middle class Americans, and in particular uh, in our manufacturing sector, and a lot of people here in our heartland, and uh, that we absolutely need to make sure that we address issues, uh, like I mentioned earlier, like labor standards uh, in countries that we have trade agreements with, so that we make sure that uh, we can produce goods at a uh, reasonable rate along with the other countries. Uh, so I think NAFTA would be one place where I would uh, differentiate uh, to some degree on that. Um, think of a time when you had to make uh, a decision that was the right thing to do, but probably the least popular option. Um, in other words, it, it, at a time when you had to make an unpopular decision, um, even though it was the right thing to do. Um, well, that's a <laughs> uh, you're throwing me for a loop on that one. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there have probably been plenty of times. Nothing specifically comes to mind right now, um, but I think that's a framework that I live by, uh, that you always try and do the right thing, even when it isn't necessarily the most popular thing to be doing. Uh, so I'm going to make it uh, that uh, priority, uh, that value system that I grew up with, uh, a priority for me out in Congress. Because I know there will be times uh, where I will disagree with something uh, and uh, um, you know, put forth an answer that might not be as popular with everybody. And then I think the important thing there is to have good data behind you, understand, know what you're talking about, have good facts, and uh, be ready to support your argument. Is there something that David Young has done in office that you actually agree with? Yeah, uh, well, I'll tell you what. He uh, has uh, tried to, he supported a bill to help uh, reduce the amount of suicides in our, with our farmers. And I think that that's something that's really important to address. And I applaud him for uh, doing that. So there's an area that I would agree with him. Uh, I think in general, though, the way that he votes uh, with this administration uh, is, uh, and he votes with this administration almost 99% of the time, uh, is hurting Iowans. So I agree with, uh, I, I'm glad he's working on that, that bill. Um, but I think he needs to think about Iowans a little bit more and uh, when he's out in making his decisions and voting. So what are if you, if you make it through the primary? What are what are what are the key differentiators that you see between a vote for you versus a vote for David Young? Well, I think one of the things is that people want to see uh, people who know how to get things done and see a change out in Washington to start fixing a lot of these problems. And David Young is a career politician. He's been out there his entire uh, life. He was, of course, Senator Grassley's chief of staff. Uh, and now uh, our congressperson. Uh, and uh, I think it's important that we send somebody out there that actually understands the struggles that Iowa families face. And when you haven't been here, uh, when you haven't raised a family, when you haven't uh, had your own business or necessarily worked here, it's hard to realize those things. And so I think that that's one key differentiator is that this guy is a political insider. He votes uh, the way that this his political leadership wants him to vote. Uh, listen, he told Iowans he would vote against uh, the Republican health care bill and then in the middle of the night uh, turned around and voted for it, even though he had verbally told Iowans, and his staff had as well, that he was going to vote against it. Uh, Iowans deserve better than that. We need somebody who's going to be honest and somebody who's going to uh, live up to what they say uh, and uh, represent the needs that Iowans are facing. And so I think the fact that he's been uh, out in Washington for his career uh, that he isn't in touch with what Iowans' uh, needs are is uh, something that works against him, and it's an advantage that I have. You could argue that uh, the third district, looking at recent election results, has leaned more Republican than in earlier years. Well, um, certainly to win in the fall, you'd need to win over independents as well as Republicans. What part of your platform do you think really would appeal to independents and Republicans? Well, I, I think uh, a couple of things. Uh, environmental issues, uh, rural issues, uh, and certainly uh, health care and uh, public education. Uh, one of the things that uh, we haven't talked about today is our rural communities in depth. And uh, our rural communities are definitely uh, feeling the pinch of an economy uh, and a society that hasn't necessarily uh, given, they haven't seen as many advantages of we, as we've seen in metro areas. I walked into uh, Mount Air not too long ago in Ringgold County, one of our 
smallest, uh, least populated counties. Uh, my second cousin was there, so had a little street cred in Ringgold County. But they were telling me a story that they had to pool their money together uh, out of their own individual pockets to buy new street lamps for their town square because they weren't working and they didn't have the resources uh, to do that. And so they're really doing a lot, our rural communities, to make sure that their communities succeed, that they, uh, they, they, they prop up uh, what they need, uh, that they support each other. And uh, I want to make sure that we help our rural communities uh, through, uh, I want to put forth an infrastructure bill to address our of course, roads and bridges, uh, our water and sewer systems. We've got pipes that are almost 100 years old that are ripe for failure. Uh, and as well as, uh, of course, cellular and broadband to make sure that all of our uh, communities can compete in today's economy. So I want to make sure that we help our rural communities by working on an infrastructure bill uh, and then, of course, making sure that we help our small businesses to keep our main streets alive, uh, protect our schools and our regional hospitals. Uh, that's why we need to keep things like uh, you know, Medicaid subsidies flowing. If we don't, uh, our regional hospitals uh, can shutter their doors, which will really impact those communities. And we need to keep make sure that our public school systems have what they need. It's, our, it's going to be our rural communities that are hit first and are hit the hardest. And so uh, that's something that I want to make sure that we protect. Uh, and when I go to Congress, I want to focus on our rural communities as well. We are running short on time, so I'll just uh, let you uh, answer one last question. Uh, why should the Des Moines Register endorse you? Uh, well, first and foremost, thank you for this opportunity, and I hope I uh, earn your endorsement. Uh, again, um, I'm very grateful for the work that you all do. I know that as journalists, it's a it's a tough job and not always one that's uh, that you're thanked for. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, I think that. Uh, we need to send somebody out to Congress who's going to look out for the best interests of Iowa, that understands the needs that we face, uh, that can hit the ground running, and has the experience to solve complex government problems, and the leadership to do it. Uh, I think it's important that we send somebody with a varied background. I believe being a public servant, a small business owner, uh, also worked uh, for uh, large corporations uh, prior to this as well, uh, gives me a really good understanding of how uh, our economy functions, uh, how people are uh, struggling, and uh, certainly um, uh, you know what's needed in this in this country. Uh, I think it's time we send somebody out there uh, that actually has been a community activist uh, that's been involved in uh, trying to raise up the lives of the people that live here. And so I hope you'll uh, endorse me as the candidate that can work across the aisle uh, that has had that opportunity before, and uh, we'll continue that out in Washington. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, there are two other Democrats running in the contested primary for Iowa's third district. Uh, one of them, Pete D'Alessandro, met with us last week. You can see that video on Des Moines Register.com. Um, and uh, Eddie Morrow is scheduled to meet with us in the next few weeks. Um, you can also watch our meetings with the Democratic candidates for governor. So see Des Moines Register.com for the schedule and all the coverage of the primary election. Thank you.